ask you, I'm going to ask you three multiple choice questions. Use this device, use this device to answer. The first question is, how did the number of deaths per year from natural disaster, how does that change during the last century? Did it more than double? Did it remain about the same in the world as a whole? Or did it decrease to less than a half? Please answer, please answer, A, B or C. I see lots of answers. This is much faster than I do it at universities. They are so slow, they keep thinking, thinking, thinking. Oh, very, very good. And we go to the next question. So how long did women 30 years old in the world go to school? Seven years, five years or three years? A, B or C, please answer. And we go to the next question. In the last 20 years, how did the percentage of people in the world who live in extreme poverty change? Extreme poverty, not having enough food for the day. Did it almost double? Did it remain more or less the same, or did it half? A, B, or C? No answers. <laughs> you see, death from national disasters in the world, you can see it from this graph here, from 1900 to 2000. In 1900, there was about half a million people who died every year from national disasters. Floods, earthquake, volcanic eruption, whatever, you know, droughts. Huh? And, and then, how did that change? We asked, the Gapminder asked the uh, public in Sweden. This is how they answered. Huh? The Swedish public answered like this. 50% thought it had doubled, 38% said it's more or less the same, 12 said it had halved. This is the best data from the disaster researchers. Uh, and it goes up and down, and it goes to, to the Second World War, and after that, it starts to fall, and it keeps falling, and it's down to much less than a half. The world has been much, much more capable as the decades go back to protect people from this, you know. So only 12% of the Swedes knew this. So I went to the zoo, and I asked the chimps. The shimps doesn't watch the evening news. <laughs> so the shimps, you know, they, they, they just choose by random. So the Swedes answer worse than random. Now, how did you do? That's you. You were beaten by the shimps. <laughs> but it was close. You were three times better than the Swedes, you know. But that's not enough. You shouldn't compare yourself to Swedes, you know. <laughs> You must have higher ambitions in the world. <laughs> Let's look at the next answer here. Women in school. Here, you can see men went eight years. How long did women go to school? Well, we ask the Swedes like this. And that gives you a hint, doesn't it? The right answer is probably the one where fewest Swedes pick, isn't it? <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Here we come. Yes, yes, yes. Women have almost catched up. This is the U.S. public. This is the U.S. public, and this is you. Here you come. Ooh. Well, congratulations, you're twice as good as the Swedes, but you don't do me. So, so, how come? I think it's like this, that everyone is aware of that there are countries and there are areas where girls have great difficulties. They are stopped when they go to school, you know, and it's, it's, it's disgusting. But in the majority of the world, where most people in the world live, most countries, girls today go to school as long as boys, more or less. Eh? That doesn't mean that gender equity is achieved, not at all. They still still are confrontated to terrible, terrible limitations. But schooling is there in the world today. Now, we miss the majority. When you answer, you answer according to the worst places. And there you are right, but you miss the majority. What about poverty? Well, it's, it's very clear that poverty here was almost halved. And in the US, when we asked the public, only 5% got it right. Huh? And you? Ah, you almost made it to the chimp. <laughs> that little, just a few of you. Just a few of you, eh? There must, be, there must be preconceived ideas, you know. 
Uh, and many in the rich countries, they think that, oh, we can never end extreme poverty. Of course they think so, because they don't even know what has happened. The first thing to think about the future is to know about the present. These questions were a few of the first ones in the pilot phase of the ignorance project in Gapminder Foundation that we run. And uh, it was started, this project, last year by my boss and also my son, Ola Rosling, <laughs> his co-founder and director. And he wanted, Ola told me, we have to be more systematic when we fight devastating ignorance. So already the pilots revealed this, that so many in the public score worse than random. So we had to think about preconceived ideas. And one of the main preconceived ideas is about world income distribution. Look here, this is how it was 1975. It's the number of people on each income. <laughs> From one dollar, one dollar a day. See, there was one hump here around one dollar a day. And then there was one hump here somewhere between 10 and 100 dollars. The world was two groups. It was a camel world, like a camel with two humps. The poor one and the rich ones. And there were fewer in between. But look how this has changed. As I go forward, what has changed, the world population has grown, you know, and the humps start to merge. Eh? The lower hump merged with the upper hump. And the camel dies and we have a dromedary world <laughs> with one hump only. The percent in poverty has decreased, still it's appalling that so many remain in extreme poverty. We still have this group, almost a billion over there, but that can be ended now. The challenge we have now, you know, is to get away from the understand where the majority is, and that was very clearly shown in this question. We asked, what is the percentage of the world's one-year-old children who have got those basic vaccines against measles and other things that we've had for many years? 20, 50, or 80 percent. Now, this is what the US public and the Swedish answered. And you see, look at the Swedish result, you know what the right answer is. <laughs> Who the heck is professor of global health in that country? Well, well it's me. It's me. You see? It's very difficult, this. It's very difficult. Huh? However, Ula's approach to really measure what we know made headlines, and CNN published these results on their web, and they had the questions there, millions answered, and I think there was about, there was about 2,000 comments, and this was one of the comments, you know. I bet no member of the media passed the test, he said. So, Ola told me, take these devices, you are invited to media conferences, give it to them and measure what the media know. And ladies and gentlemen, for the first time, the informal result from a conference with US media. And then, lately, from the European Union media. <laughs> you see, the problem is not that people don't read and listen to the media, the problem is that the media doesn't know themselves. What shall we do about this, Ula? Do you have an idea? Yes, uh, I have an idea, but first, I'm so sorry that you were beaten by the chimps. Uh, fortunately, I will be able to comfort you by showing why it was not your fault, actually. Then I will equip you with some tricks for beating the chimps in the future. That's basically what I will do. But first, let's look at why are we so ignorant. And it all starts in this place. It's Hudiksvall. It's a city in northern Sweden. It's a neighborhood where I grew up. And it's uh, a neighborhood with a large problem. Actually, it has exactly the same problem which existed in all the neighborhoods where you grew up as well. It was not representative, okay? It gave me a very biased view of how life is on this planet. So, this is the first piece of the ignorance puzzle. We have a personal bias. We have all different experiences from communities and people we meet. And on top of this, we start school and we add the next problem. Well, I like schools, but teachers tend to uh, teach an uh, outdated worldview, because they learned something when they went to school, and now they describe this word to the students without any bad intentions. And those books, of course, that are printed are outdated uh, in a world that changes. 
And there is really no practice to keep the teaching material up to date. So that's what we're focusing on. So we have these outdated facts added on top of our personal bias. What happens next is news, okay? An excellent journalist knows how to pick the story that will make headlines, and people will read it because it's sensational. It's unusual events are more interesting, don't? And, and they are exaggerated, and especially things we're afraid of would get... I mean, a shark attack on a Swedish person would get headlines for weeks in Sweden, you know? <laughs> okay, so these three skewed sources of information was really hard to get away from, wasn't it? You know, they, they kind of bombardize us and equip our mind with a lot of strange ideas, and on top of it, we put the very thing that makes us humans, our human intuition, okay? It was good in evolution. Uh, it helped us generalize and jump to conclusions very, very fast. Uh, it helped uh, help us exaggerate what we're afraid of. And we see causality where there is none. And we then get an illusion on, of confidence where we believe that we are the best car drivers uh, above the average. Everybody answered that question. Yeah, I drive cars better. Okay, this was good evolutionary, but now when it comes to the worldview, it is the exact reason why it's upside down. The trends that are increasing are instead falling and the other way around. And in this case, the chimps use our intuition against us, and it becomes our weakness instead of our strength. It was supposed to be our strength, wasn't it? So how do we solve such problem? First, we need to measure it and then we need to cure it. So by measuring it, we can understand what is the pattern of ignorance. We started the pilot last year, and now we're pretty sure that we will encounter a lot of ignorance across the whole world. And uh, the idea is really to uh, scale it up to all domains or dimensions of global uh, development, such as climate, endangered species, human rights, gender equality, energy, finance, all different sectors have facts, and there are organizations trying to spread awareness about these facts. So I've, I've started actually contacting some of them, like WWF and Amnesty International and UNICEF, and asking them, what are your favorite facts which you think the public don't know? OK, I gather those facts. Imagine a long list with, say, 250 facts. And then we poll the public and see where they score worst. OK, so we get a shorter list with the terrible results, like some few examples, Hans, and we had no problems finding these kind of terrible results. OK, this little short list, what are we going to do with it? Well, we turn it into a knowledge certificate, a global knowledge certificate, which you can use if you're a large organization, a school, a university, or maybe a news agency to certify yourself as globally knowledgeable, OK? Uh, basically meaning we don't hire people who score like chimpanzees, you know? Of course you shouldn't. Um, so maybe 10 years from now, if this project succeeds, you will be sitting at an interview having to fill out this crazy <laughs> global knowledge. So th th now we come to the, the practical tricks. How are you going to succeed, OK? There is, of course, uh, one way, which is to sit down late nights and learn all the facts by heart, by reading all these reports. That will never happen, actually. Not even Hans thinks that's going to happen. People don't have that time. People like shortcuts. And here are the shortcuts. We need to turn our intuition into strength again. We need to be able to generalize. So now I'm going to show you some tricks where the misconceptions are turned around, into rules of thumb. Let's start with the first misconception. This is very widely spread. Everything is getting worse. You heard it. You thought it yourself. Okay? The other way to think is most things improve. Okay? So you're sitting with a question in front of you and you're unsure. You should guess improve. Okay? Don't go for the worse. <laughs> that will help you score better on our tests. Okay? That was the first one. OK, there are rich and poor, and the gap is increasing. It's a terrible inequality. Yeah, it's an unequal world, but when you look at the data, it's one hump, OK? If you feel unsure, go for the most people are in the middle, OK? That's going to help you get the answer right. Now, the next preconceived idea is, uh, first, countries and people need to be very, very rich 
to get the social development, like girls in school and be ready for natural disasters. No, 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 that's wrong. Look, that huge hump in the middle already have girls in school. So if you are unsure, go for the, the majority already have this, like electricity and girls in school, these kind of things. It's, it's the only rules of thumb. So co of course they don't apply to everything, but this is how you can generalize. Let's look at the last one. If something, if, yes, this, this is a good one, sharks are dangerous, okay, no, you, well, yes, but, <laughs> but they are not so important in the global statistics, that's, that's what I'm saying. I actually, I, I'm a very afraid of sharks, so as soon as I see a question about things I'm afraid of, which might be earthquakes, other religions, maybe I'm afraid of terrorists or sharks, anything that makes me feel, assume you're going to exaggerate the problem. Okay? That, that's a rule of thumb. Of course, there are dangerous things that are also great. Sharks kill very, very few. That's how you should think. With these four uh, rules of thumb, <laughs> you could probably answer better than the chimps, because the chimp cannot do this. They cannot generalize these kind of rules. Okay? And hopefully, we can turn your world around and we're going to beat the chimps. Okay? That's a systematic approach. Now the question, is this important? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's important to understand poverty, extreme poverty, and how to, to fight it, and how to bring girls uh, in school. When we realize actually it's succeeding, we can, we can understand it. But, but is it important for everyone else who cares about the rich end of this scale? I would say yes, extremely important, for the same reason. If you have a fact-based worldview of today, you might have a chance to understand what's coming next in the future. We're going back to these two humps in 1975, that's when I was born, and I uh, selected the West, that's uh, the current EU countries and North America. Let's now see how the rest and the West compares in terms of how rich you are. These are the people who af can afford to fly abroad with an airplane for vacation. In 1975, only 30% of them lived outside EU and North America. But this has changed, okay? So first, let's look at the change up till today, 2014. Today, it's 50-50. The Western domination is over as of today. That's nice. So what's going to happen next? Do you see the big hump? Did you see how it moved? I, I did a little experiment. I went to the IMF, International Monetary Fund, website. They have a forecast for the next five years of GDP per capita. So I, ca I can use that to go five years into the future, assuming the income inequality of each country is the same. I did that, but I, I went even further. I used those five years for the next 20 years with the same speed. Just as an experiment, what might actually happen? Let's move into the future. In 2020, it's 57 percent in the rest. In 2025, 63 percent. 2030, 68. And in 2035, the West is outnumbered. Okay, in the rich consumer market. These are just the projections of GDP per capita into the future. 73% of the rich consumers are going to live outside North America and Europe. So yes, I think it's a good idea for a company to use this certificate to make sure they make fact-based decisions in the future. Thank you very much. Hans and Ola Rosling. Thank you.